said a couple of years ago, the obituaries about this organization are highly overrated. <laughs> I think we're going to have a little fun this evening. I got to thinking that since it was the 25th convention, that it would be more fun to spread around a little bit and get some uh, information from more people than just a few. And anyone who has worked with this organization for a number of years knows that there are a lot of little anecdotes that would be fun to share. So rather than have a uh, kind of cut and dried sort of thing, I decided I would ask a lot of these fellows to give us a few minutes entertainment and then we'll go on with the main program. But I thought that Mr. Staley would enjoy having maybe some stories told. No. no. <laughs> and so uh, these are in no particular order. We've just got some fellows who are good enough to agree to have a little fun with us. Now, Oris is going to be the speaker prior to Mr. Staley, and Don Zmolik, who is from Iowa and worked with the organization a long time, Lee Elliott, who has promotions and has been with Public Info for as many years as I have known about it, and uh, Kenton Bailey from Maine, and Glenn Utley from Indiana, Joe Sonnenmoser from Missouri, and I know that any of you people who have had sausage feeds over the year that these faces are not strange, they're very familiar to you. So I would like to just start off with Lee Elliott. I've asked him if he would give the invocation and we'll get on with the program. Fred could do the best job. Thank you, Doris. <clears throat> I've got a couple little yards on Owen Lee and no matter how vehemently he denies these stories, I'll swear on a stack of Bibles is the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Way back in the early years of uh, NFO, I don't remember the exact year, you know, about the time we started those famous sausage feeds. We had one uh, up at Rushville. For those of you who don't know where Rushville is, I'm 60 miles north of here, up towards St. Joe. And uh, it's just a stop in the road, as Orrin Lee knows. And, but it's home for the Sonnenmoser brothers and a few other loyal NFO members. We had this sausage feed, and you know, none of us were any good at talking before people or whatever back in those years. And it was right in the middle of the winter, late winter. And uh, we had all kinds of people there. I'm telling you, we had three, 400 people there. The place was full. And... It came time for Orrin Lee to speak, and it was snowing like the Billy Blue Blazes that night. And uh, Scotty Hall, Orrin Lee, was delegated to call and see where Orrin Lee was. It was time for me. We had run out of everything. We, everybody had eaten. We had a guy doing magic tricks, and he was pretty good. And uh, he'd run out of all of his magic, and of course we were waiting for the the master magician of all, <laughs> Ornley Staley. And uh, Scotty Hall was delegated to go to the phone and see what happened to Ornley. Well, the snow was getting deeper and deeper, and it was maybe four or five inches deep then. So <clears throat> Scotty come back and said, well, Ornley has uh, just left Corning. And uh, so we waited another hour, and we put this magician through his bag of tricks a second time, and all these people were waiting, some three, four hundred people. And uh, we wondered, well, can Orrin Lee make it? The snow was at that time maybe eight, nine inches deep. <clears throat> so pretty soon the phone rang, and Orrin Lee says, I'm in Maryville, Missouri, and the, the snow is about hubcap deep. Should I keep on? We said, by all means, we run out of tricks, and these people are waiting, and they're getting anxious. So... Orrin Lee finally made it in another hour and a half or so. And you never saw such a bunch of relieved people in your life. And I tell you, he put on one of his best acts to, uh, up to date at that time. I mean, he really gave us a, a bell ragging speech. Now, I got another little yarn. This one's a little worse, Orrin Lee. <coughs> <coughs> you know, Orrin Lee had a habit over the years. He was a light sleeper. How many of you know that? He's a pretty light sleeper. And once in a while, when he gets that 
think tank up there are going, why he'll call people on the telephone. Now the only problem is that sometimes it'll be, what, 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning. So one night my wife and I were sleeping and uh, the phone rang about 2 o'clock in the morning and she said, uh, maybe that's an emergency of some kind. Or somebody, we didn't have any kids out, they were all small and at home. I've got eight incidentally. And uh, so I sleepily answered. The <laughs> I didn't hear that. Now we were sleeping. <clears throat> so uh, I finally made my way to the telephone and still asleep and I picked it up and said hello and the other voice said this is Orrin Lee and he said uh, Joe he said I've been sitting here thinking up in Corning or wherever he was and I want to run a few ideas by you and see what you think of them and I said uh huh I was still asleep and <clears throat> of course Orrin Lee when he'd call you like that he'd never talk for five minutes so I think after maybe ever ten minutes Orrin Lee would say Joe, are you there? And I'd say, yeah. And after maybe 45 minutes, <clears throat> Orrin Lee said, what did you think of that? I just said, amen. <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when I got back to bed, my wife said, who was that? And I said, that was Orrin Lee Staley. She said, what did he say? I said, damned if I know. <laughs> I would like to call on Iowa next. Don Zmolik probably spent as much time around the office in the so-called think tank as anybody. And uh, we're glad to have him back with us tonight. He'd been sick recently, but I don't think that'll hurt his storytelling ability any. Don Zmolik. How many of you were involved, or members at the time of the uh, milk holding action back in 67? Uh, yeah, there were a few. <laughs> okay, quite a few. Uh, you all know that the milk action was probably one of the grittier ones, definitely, because the livestock holding actions weren't all that serious, even though a lot of us as members thought they were because everything was getting so overweight and all. but. See that old milk go down the drain or out the field, on the ground, uh, just, just put a few thoughts in everybody's mind. I think all of you would agree that we're involved. Some of the gals uh, bathed in the bulk tank and got a lot of good publicity and some of that sort of stuff. But to conduct that holding action as well as many of the ones that preceded it and the one after that, uh, we had... Uh, Oh, at the time we called it the Victory Control Center, and what it amounted to was one room uh, near the alley in the office. Uh, no particular reason it was near the alley, except it was just handy to get in and out of, and, and uh, we worked or manned it around the clock, everyone that was down there, and all departments were involved in manning the phone. Orrin Lee would come through quite often to see what information was coming in on the phones from you folks out there. And uh, then occasionally we'd be calling out information to uh, all of you out there to keep everybody informed and up to date. Well, then everything was coming real well. The uh, Many, many of those contracts were signed. The, the dairy staff had appointments to uh, go out the following Monday, I believe. I may have my days wrong here, but there were appointments set up to get enough more signatures on those dairy processor contracts that the milk action would have been a total victory. And then came a call to Orrin Lee in his office uh, regarding some action that the government was taking. Mr. LBJ uh, Fink at that time uh, made a public comment on let's, uh, uh, let's uh, uh, dump, wait a minute, <laughs> dump LBJ, but hold our milk and dump LBJ. Uh, but at any rate, uh, Orrin Lee came back and he had uh, 
a very long face on him. You, you could tell he was not elated by any means, and and uh, it just those of us that worked closely with him knew that it was so we'd hit some snags. His face, facial expression was rather serious, and so he filled us in. And of course, none of us being lawyers and that, uh, I may have the terminology wrong, but. At any rate, he told about how LBJ had, uh, and the Justice Department had moved against the organization to take measures to stop our progress and just stop us in our track, and that there had been uh, uh, affidavits uh, filed and an injunction was about to be slapped on, and, and uh, he shook his head and very thoughtful, trying to figure out some solution to this, and that, it, that involved all of us, so we all had the long faces. and and how are we going to come out of this one and because it had been going so well and victory seemed so close. And it was a mighty gloomy place. Yeah, there, the faces were long. There wasn't a trace of a smile. Everybody's brain was working over time. It just happened. There was a lull in the phone calls at that time too. And so there was silence and sadness. And then the fellow on the end, Mr. Kinerva, uh, came up with a very thoughtful observation. He says, you say they, they filed, some, filed an affidavit? And Hornley says, yes. He says, could have been worse. Could have been a whole David. Northeast, who has such a delightful accent. Those of you who have heard him speak at Sausage Feeds, besides a good wit and his accent, uh, he's got a good little anecdote to tell. Kenton Bailey. Doris, Doris cornered me this afternoon and asked me if I'd uh, make a few remarks and not take more than four minutes, and I told her to take an hour and 59 minutes just to get warmed up. <laughs> you want me to turn the volume up? Okay. How's that? When she asked me to come and speak to the ladies this evening, sitting here and looking out into this audience, makes me think of a situation we had back in the Northeast. We have a county up there that uh, it didn't join NFO in the milk holding action when most of the country got involved in NFO. They came in a couple of years later. They raised potatoes and a few other things. They can't raise cane, it's too cold up there. But they always thought they were a little bit better than everybody else. And after the initial interest of the novelty of getting involved in such things as dumping milk and shooting hogs and a few other things, we'd signed up about 100, about 1,037 memberships in that county. And they become aware that they were the biggest landmass area in New England, bigger than some of the rest of the states. We began to lose interest. And one of the things we noticed, Orrin Lee would come up or somebody else and hold a meeting, and the audience was almost always no women. Well, it got down to the point where it was left up to us fellows to fight the war in the trench all the time to do something about getting that county going again. We'd tried just about everything, and in most of the counties, as you well know, across the country, and as is seen in this audience here, there are a lot of women that contribute an awful lot to NFO course, to our marriages and our homes and everything else, too, and keeping feeding America. But somehow in that county, it wasn't very prevalent. So we'd send out notices from the office up there, eight, nine hundred of them, and we'd hold a county meeting, and the attendance kept getting lower and lower, and we had to devise something to get people to come back to the meetings, because by then we had begun to develop a commodity program where people could sign their production up and sell it through NFO. So we had this young fellow that had worked for us for about a year, and we were right to wit's end. We were sitting one night in the hotel room, and he said, what do you think we could do? Well, I said, if there's only some way we could make them jealous or something like that, maybe we could get these fellows to come back to the meeting. So 
striking upon that, we adopted a letter, and we left after it said, Dear Mrs. or Dear Miss, we'd fill the wife's or the daughter's or whatever it was, mother's name in, and then when the letter went something like this. Have you wondered in the last two winters what your husband has been doing when he's been telling you that he's been going to an NFO meeting? <laughs> Do you have any idea what the initials NFO stand for? And that's when we first adopted the saying about NFO stands for nuts, freaks, and oddballs. It said, if he's been telling you he's been going to a farm meeting that's doing something about potato prices, how come they're just half as high as they were two years ago when he joined? <laughs> Have you got that new living room set that he promised you five years ago if something could be done? And then we went on to say in the second paragraph that there would be a meeting held. Now, this is a real big county. It's surrounded on three sides, the north, the east, and the west by Canada. And then there's a large stretch of woods between that and the rest of the United States. <laughs> so we almost always, whenever we did anything in that county, had to have three meetings, one on the southern tip, one halfway, and one up on the northern tip of the county. And so we set up three meetings. We sent these letters out, and we told them there was a meeting for women only, mothers, wives, sisters of NFO members, and please attend. And we don't want your husband, your brother, or your father there. The first meeting, they turned out about somewhere between 25 and 30 women. Now, it was very funny because some of these gentlemen farmers that could get up and go down the street and eat breakfast, go back to their potato house in the forenoon and come back to town and eat dinner at 11 o'clock, go back to the potato house, go back to town and eat supper, and then disappear when there was an NFO meeting. They showed up out in the hallways. Well, we just went to the door, and before we started the meeting, we just told them, excuse us, we've got to close these doors. We've got to get on with this meeting. Well, needless enough to say, by the time the second meeting was held, there was about 50-odd women showed up, and what we did was we took the membership agreement, the farmer's worst nine years, and a few other things, and we indoctrinated them in the philosophy of NFO. By the time we got ready to hold the third meeting, they'd called a county meeting, and we had one of the best and most interesting and most active meetings in that county that they'd had in over a year's time, and we began to sign up production. Now, the point I'm making is, as I looked out in this audience tonight, I said it was a, a ladies' or a women's meeting, and I see, I would say, more men here than women. Now, I don't know. Maybe they figure like those fellows did. They had to go because they're afraid they're going to miss something. Well, I guess that's enough of that. I'm glad to see you all here and uh, be looking forward to talking to you later. Thank you, Kenton. Well, we ladies who are here know that the contributions that women make to NFO are usually the kind that you don't see or hear about. The cows get milked and the kids get fed and the mail gets answered, and the kinds of things that kind of keep the household going. But there are other things that are necessary, too. And I'm going to put in a little plug for our workshops on Wednesday. We're going to have some lady county presidents and district officers uh, to speak there and give you some ideas on some of the creative things they're doing in their counties. And uh, the ladies can take these ideas back home to the fellows. And the ladies' meeting is intended to be for their benefit, but we don't mind at all that they bring the men along. The next fellow I'm going to call on is Phil Allen. Phil has probably as much seniority with the organization at this point uh, as anyone still on the scene. Phil was our first PR person. Get that, Phil, person and is still in their pitching. We have come from a one-person PR effort to a large organization such as you see today, and Phil has kept pace. He has one of the most um, recognizable voices in the country, and I think we're kind of proud to call him ours. Phil? <laughs> Orrin Lee, 
and distinguished old timers and members of the NFO. I'm nine years older than Orrin Lee Staley. So you see, when Staley was still in his 30s, I was already famous, uh, sort of famous, all the way from Grand Island to Council Bluffs anyway. <laughs> and uh, I was known all the way from Albert Lee, Minnesota to Omaha, because in those days I worked for various labor unions in the Middle West, the old CIO, United Packing House Workers Union, and a number of other unions in Woodbury County and in southern Minnesota. I was asked by the district director of the old CIO packing house workers to go to Corning, Iowa one time because the Des Moines Register was describing what were called drought protest meetings. Jay Loffrey, who was a farmer from near Corning and who was a Mormon feed salesman, had been calling meetings at country schoolhouses and sale barns and it, there'd been scarcely any publicity in the daily press, but he was getting crowds of two and three and four hundred and uh, former governor of Iowa, Dan Turner, who was the last Republican governor before the New Deal, had been gathering big crowds. So they sent me from Omaha and a guy from Des Moines to go to Corning to find out what it was these farmers were up to. So I suppose I attended the third or fourth or fifth NFO meeting. And this was a meeting before Orrin Lee Staley was interested in the NFO. And yet I think I can call it an NFO meeting because I heard the speaker say, well, boys, we've chosen the name for this new organization. It's going to have the most simple, direct, objective name you could pick. It's going to be nationwide, so it'll be called national. There'll only be farmers, so it'll be called farmers. And it's going to be called organization, national farmers organization, simple. Somebody said, why don't we call it a union? So there was a big laugh in the crowd. Well, there's already the farmers union, but that's no union. And so they laughed about that. But now let me tell you what the big issue was that took up most of the time of that meeting. There was quite a debate that went on at the old Corning sale barn whether they should put aluminum tags in the hog's ears because if they did, maybe they could get the packing house workers in all of these packing cities to process only the hogs that had the aluminum tags in their ears. Now, of course, as we know now, that would have been illegal according to the antitrust laws because farmers must bargain only for farmers. And the union people organized under Taft-Hartley may bargain only for working people. The next time I ran across this guy, Orrin Lee Staley, that came to be known more and more about was, I think, in 1958, when I had spoken at a meeting in Lincoln. I think the Lincoln State NFO had asked me to be one of the speakers. In those days, they usually had a labor speaker. And the labor unions had a good verbal knowledge of the farm question because they were trying to court the farmer labor vote the way Minnesota people do. Or at least, well, the arithmetic was something like this. There were roughly 25 million working people in the cities in those days, and there were roughly 25 million farmers. So they figured, well, if you could get them to vote alike, you'd have 50 million votes, and that could dominate most any election. So the labor people talked a great deal about the farm question. And I remember in those days that you could get as many different versions of how you could solve the farm problem as there were people speaking at most platforms in those days. There was a long and complicated debate over whether parity should be sliding or flexible or fixed or high or low. There were proposals to license farmers. There were proposals to do this and that, a two-price system an export price and a domestic price. You remember those days. And so you can see that farmers were in a great, uh, they were in a mood to get away from that debate, which was boring the public. There were some real issues, real solid ones, as you recognize, any time we hearken back to those days. This wasn't a trivial debate, but the public wasn't paying much attention. So when this group that grew out of farm protest, as the Des Moines Register called it, suddenly started talking about farmers solving their own problem, 
with collective bargaining, then the attention of the public was really zeroed in on it. So received a phone call one evening in Omaha, and it was this Oren Lee Staley asking me to come downtown to have coffee with him at Dixon's Cafe. And when I got back home, Mrs. Allen asked me, well, what did he want? And I said, do you know, you see, the labor unions had just been in a great big battle to try to wipe out the north-south wage differential. The packing house workers in Alabama and Mississippi and Georgia were being paid less than they were in the northern part of the country. And I said, do you know that he thinks he can organize farmers all across the country? And I said, do you think he has any idea how big the packing industry is? It's nationwide. And I said, you know, he really intends to do something like that. I don't know whether he has any idea how big it is, but that's what he has in mind doing. So it wasn't until many more months later that I started working for the NFO because the program that I was on in Sioux City was going to founder because the old Cudahy plant in Sioux City had gone broke. And that meant that there were three or 4,000 packing house workers out of a job. And they couldn't afford to keep me on the air anymore. And I had spoken at labor meetings, so I went to Corning and I asked Staley and the then NFO National Board, which were seven or eight guys who seemed to be in session all the time. <laughs> I think they uh, slept on cots and then they'd get in their cars and they'd drive around the countryside. First time I ever saw Staley's car, it was a new Chevy. And then about six months later, I saw it again, and it sounded like a truck. <laughs> it went to pucket, to pucket, to pucket, but it got from place to place. The only other memories I have of those early days with Staley and the early NFO people was that when you'd drive along, I remember one time they sent Bob Casper and me to cover a meeting, <laughs> and neither Casper or I, well, you know, Casper lectured, kind of the way I'm doing now. You people aren't laughing or applauding, you're just sort of listening. <laughs> and when you got both Casper and me at the same platform, we, <laughs> we were driving home back to Omaha from, I think, Denison, Iowa, and he says to me, you know, Phil, I don't think they ought to send the both of us out to the same meeting again. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that we were in the, some kind of a station wagon and Staley and Casper and I and Butch Swaim and some other people were driving from Ottumwa to Jefferson City. And it took about eight hours because every time we'd st see a sail barn or anything resembling a crowd, Staley would get out of the station wagon and shake hands with everybody and hand out handbills and all that. Well, that's the way it was in those days. Any chance to meet anyone or talk it up, we did it. And I think this generation of Americans, farmers especially, are grateful to Staley and all you people who did that. I'm glad to be here. Is it any wonder that they portrayed Staley as an unbelievable optimist. But then he surrounded himself with these kind of guys and that's why we're still here and have a 25th. But by this time, aren't we having a good time and do you suppose that if enough farmers would wear tuxedos, we could have made a roast, you know? <laughs> that would have been one way to keep these guys out if we'd have told them to wear tuxedos, huh? There was one person who said, well, I will if I can come up with something. Is Ben Stong here? Where's Ben? Where is he? Ben? He's a marvelous storyteller. If you can get him going. He's not here? Okay. Then we have the senior member of the National Board, Glenn Utley from Indiana. And I thought, if there are any skeletons, he knows where they are. Thank you, Doris, Lauren Lee. <laughs> the hell of it is he gets to speak last. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Thank you, Doris, Lauren Lee, and members, and FO. It's a pleasure to be here this evening to talk about some of the things in the past, what has happened, and why we're here. You know, but I remember back when we had the National Convention of 1956, which is the first one that I attended, St. Joe, Missouri. Maybe there's 250 of us there, and boy, we just going to tear hell out of this country <laughs> with, with about $600 or less. <laughs> so, <laughs> but we did spread out from there. I remember when we started into collective bargaining in 1958. It was just as big a battle as some of the battles that we've had since. The only thing is there wasn't as many of them. Boy, it was, we was tying with labor, we was doing everything because collective bargaining had not been heard of in agriculture. And it was labor right off. A lot of farmers uh, connected us with labor. A lot of organizations connected us with labor. And we was branded that away. But it didn't hurt us because the laboring people eat what we produce. So as we started to move on, and Staley was a pretty clean sort of a man then, <laughs> and, <clears throat> but he finally started to develop some bad habits like some of the rest of us. He started smoking, but he never did buy any. <laughs> So, Orrin Lee, I haven't seen you for a few months, and I'm sure you're short of cigars. <laughs> <laughs> and I suppose... The first smoke in six months. <laughs> I suppose that I got as many of those one and two o'clock calls of the morning as probably as anybody did. And back in the earlier days, I was gone probably two or three weeks at a time, especially in the wintertime. I'm going to get in trouble with my wife on this one, but I'd been gone probably two weeks, maybe three, and had just gotten home about midnight. <coughs> then about two o'clock, the telephone rang. No. <laughs> what is wise? I could... I could, I could do a better job then than all I can now. <laughs> but anyway, the wife got up to answer the phone. I didn't even hear it ring. Of course, it was him. And Orrin Lee said, is Glenn there? She said, yes, no, wait a minute, I'll see. <laughs> So he said, it don't make any difference whether you get home or not. She don't know the difference. <laughs> but a little on the serious side, ladies and gentlemen, I think God has looked over this organization. I remember back right after that 56 convention, Ornley came to Indiana for his first meeting. He asked me, of course, he got in about noon. He'd had a call from Mattoon, Illinois, radio station, wanted to talk to him. He said, could you take me over there and we get back in time? That was about 150 miles, but I said, I guess we can. Well, he, we got over there, and he like he always was, you know. He didn't know when to leave. <laughs> and we got started late back to Princeton, Indiana for that meeting. Well, you people in Illinois, I came over that Highway 50, which was a pretty new highway at that time, about 85 and 90 mile an hour, to get back to Princeton, Indiana, for the meeting that night. The next morning, I got in my, I took him to the airport that night. Next morning, I got in my automobile, just backed it out of the driveway, stopped it to go forward, front wheel fell off. Just the day before, I'd been driving that car 
85 and 90 mile an hour. If that wheel had came off then, I doubt in that earlier day that we'd have had an NFO tonight. So there is <clears throat> there is a lot of those kind of things that have happened down through the years. But we kept on and we kept expanding on ideas at that time. Ideas. Sure, we made mistakes because we didn't have a blueprint. There wasn't any for agriculture. Until we got to the point that we are today. We developed programs for hogs, for grain, for dairy, for specialties all across this nation. Until today, we have a collective bargaining program nationwide. Something that we can all be proud of. And as Orly said when he left, I want to see it go. If the people will follow somebody else better than me, then I want to step down out of the way. Now we can talk here tonight, but I think in Orrin Lee's mind, the best thing that we could ever do for him, and what's in his mind, is that we carry on. Some of the rest of us are not going to be here too much longer either. But that we carry on and these programs are completed, that the farmer gets that cost of production plus a profit. And I think that would satisfy him more than anything else, along with everybody else. <clears throat> There's a lot to be said, but I'm not going to take any more time on it. All I want to say is, thank you, Ornley, for what you've done, what you left us with, and God bless you in your new endeavor. Well, that was to be the end of the anecdote session, but there are two people that I didn't get a chance to talk to prior to this meeting that I'll give them a chance if they want to volunteer. There are two vice presidents in this crowd that served under Mr. Staley. If either one of them would like to say something, we'll make room on the program for just a little bit more, wouldn't we? people who are as, as favored in our group as any are Mr. Earhart Fingston, who served until Devon became our vice president. And I think as an organization, we have been doubly blessed over the years that these two men served as our vice presidents. I don't think anybody... <laughs> I don't think anybody can say that the organization has been better represented or that any organization has been, has been better represented. We have Oris Kenerva here this evening, who is an old fellow Minnesotan that I've always been very fond of, and he does such an excellent job of talking about NFO. But there is someone who has worked with him closer than I have, and Lee Elliott, 
has been that person. So I would like to ask Lee to introduce Oris this evening. Thank you, Doris. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you know Oris Kernerva as well as I do. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working with him uh, over quite a span of years, and this fellow has got a little different sense of humor than the most of us and uh, can kind of tickle your ribs a little bit. Uh, Don Zamalek actually told uh, the one that I was really going to tell about, Oris, uh, but uh, when we get back to that holding action on milk, uh, I happened to be the gentleman that met the federal marshal at the front door of the home office when, uh, when he come to serve the papers. And uh, I'd never seen a federal marshal before in my life. And uh, man, I'm telling you, he looked about seven foot eight when he said he was a federal marshal. And I couldn't think of anything to say but other than, you know, Matt Dillon, you know. And I says, I said, I thought all federal marshals wore a six-shooter. And he pulled back his shirt, and he says, I do. So <laughs> but anyway, uh, Oris uh, lived at Hibbing, Minnesota, or Virginia, Minnesota, for many, many a year, and, and uh, worked in the home office uh, for many, many a year, too. And... and uh, Riceville, Iowa, where I'm originally from, was kind of right directly on the flight path from, uh, from uh, Virginia, Minnesota to uh, Corning, Iowa. And uh, so uh, uh, Oris uh, was a B-29 instructor in World War II and uh, flew his own airplane, uh, used it to commute back and forth. And uh, so uh, he would usually stop at Osage. Riceville is one of those kind of not too wide of spots on the map either. They didn't have their own airport. And so I had to drive about 18 mile into Osage, uh, which did have an airport, uh, where Oris would pick me up on Sunday night about 8 o'clock, and then we'd fly in on the Corning. But I never will forget uh, uh, when Oris first started flying, uh, he was over into Michigan holding some meetings, and there was a board meeting called, and, and uh, one of the directors rode in with him. Now, it uh, was the first airplane ride in a small plane that this director had ever had. And it was one of those nights that was so black, I mean, you know, you couldn't even see your hand that far in front of your face uh, if you didn't have something to illuminate it. And after they had been in the air for about 35 minutes, uh, well, uh, Oris said, uh, or the, the director said, uh, he says, say, he says, Oris, just how do you tell where you're at up here? Well, Oris said, uh, he says, it's really kind of simple. He says, you look out here on the right-hand side, if you'll see that... Uh, that uh, green light out there uh, uh, on the end of the wing, and he says out here on the left-hand side, that uh, red one, he says, you just keep her right between those two lights. Then they went a little bit further, and the fella, you know, was kind of speechless, and Oris thought he ought to start the conversation a little bit, and he says, you know, he says, uh, if you don't think that that propeller on an airplane is to keep the pilot cool, he says, just let us stop and see him go into a sweat. <laughs> so I don't think I need to give you any more introduction. Uh, Oris Kinerva. <laughs> 